So over the coming weeks, we're going to talk to you about um, uh, different operational research and uh, data science methods. Um, and because of that, the, the structure of the training is uh, going to differ slightly. So I'm just going to bring up the, uh, the training schedule. Uh, find it. There it is. Um, so uh, you've all obviously got, uh, uh, got a copy of this. Um, but you'll see things change up a bit now. So um, essentially, over the next uh, month-ish, um, we're going to take you through uh, a series of uh, introductory stroke taster sessions uh, where we're going to talk to you about uh, all of these different uh, OR and data science uh, methods. Um, and in each session, um, we're going to be uh, getting you to dip your toes a little bit into, uh, into this method. And then when we come to the session starting from the uh, very end of November, um, we're then going to be exploring some of those methods in more detail. So to take uh, today's uh, session as an example, so we've got discrete event simulation, which is session 5A. So that means it's uh, module five, and it's the first session, the A representing the first session uh, of module five. So we will pick up uh, discrete event simulation again uh, on the 1st of um, December. Uh, and so these black and white uh, sessions here uh, are the the option sessions so these are the ones um, where ideally uh, we'd like you to attend uh, all of them uh, and uh, we've because of the break over Christmas it, it, it still does uh, um, ensure you have an average of a, a day a week if you were to do that however um, we we do insist if you can't do that um, that you'll need to uh, choose at least uh, 21 hours of uh, these uh, these sessions starting from the 26th of November, uh, the afternoon of the 26th of November. Um, and that will allow you, if you can't attend all of them, to uh, deep dive into the ones that are particularly of interest. So you'd either pick uh, seven three-hour sessions or um, five three-hour sessions and um, session 4B, which is uh, Sean's follow-up uh, to, uh, to the R session, the R training, um, which is a full-day uh, session. Um, but as I say, the more you can attend, the better, um, and we'll certainly be going into detail. But uh, for now, um, all of the sessions will be uh, core sessions uh, right up until the uh, end of November. Um, and so we'll be introducing you to these concepts, uh, and then we'll go into more detail. So today, um, this morning, I'm going to be taking you through uh, discrete event simulation. Uh, we touched on that a little bit in the very first session of the, uh, of the training program where uh, we got you to play the uh, how long the patients spend an ED game and we talked a bit about discrete event simulation there. We're going to go into that in more detail this morning. Um, you will be delighted, I am sure, uh, to know that there is uh, no hands-on coding at all today. Um, so you're going to have a, if you're, if you're fed off of programming for a minute, um, you're, you're going to have a nice break from it uh, today. Uh, this morning we are going to um, be talking mainly about designing a discrete event simulation and there's a big exercise for you to do as a group um, uh, to try and uh, design a discrete event simulation and the sort of things you'll need to think about. Uh, and then uh, at the end of this morning's session, uh, I'm going to show you um, a uh, piece of uh, SymPy code, SymPy being the discrete event simulation framework in Python um, that allows you to build uh, these, these kinds of simulations. Uh, as I'm going to walk you through that. So hopefully you've all got SymPy installed. That will allow you to then uh, uh, to follow along and to, to run that, that code um, as well. And then this afternoon, uh, we've got um, uh, Kerry. Uh, so you've got a nice break from me. Uh, and Kerry's going to be talking you through uh, QGIS, which is a fantastically powerful piece of geographic visualization software um, that allows you to do fantastic things in terms of visualizing geographic data uh, to really get a handle on um, uh, your sort of locations of services and uh, providing information for that. Uh, and and uh, uh, Kerry's got a really good uh, session where she'll walk you through using this fantastic piece of software, which you will be delighted to hear is a really nice drag and drop piece of software. So no coding involved in that either. So you get a bit of a break from uh, at least hands-on uh, coding today, but I will be talking you through uh, a bit of SymPy uh, later this morning. Uh, the other thing I'd say about that as well is that um, uh, hopefully you will see, although I, I won't expect you to uh, fully understand the SymPy code I'm going to be talking to you, um, uh, uh, showing you this morning, um, you will find, I think, that you will start to understand uh, quite a bit of it already because you're starting to uh, become familiar with the way in which uh, Python works. So hopefully you'll start to see the value of 
um, uh, your last three weeks of, of, of getting the hang of uh, Python. So that's how it works um, uh, for, the, for the rest of the training. As I say, you've got lots of um, mainly three hour sessions apart from the R sessions, which are uh, full day um, sessions. Um, where we're going to, over the coming weeks, uh, you're going to dip your toes into lots and lots of different methods. And as I said last week, really important that you're starting to think now about what some of your, uh, what your project pitch might be, what, what, what project might you take forward and propose to undertake uh, in phase two. And uh, over the coming month, uh, as you're exposed to these methods, and you've uh, we talk about um, the potential limitations of these methods, um, it would be really good for you to start thinking about how some of these can be applied to your own organization um, and then think how uh, you might uh, develop a project um, that uses one or more um, of these methods. And as I say, in, in over the course of the next few weeks, we'll be providing more information about how those um, project pitches uh, will work. Okay, so let's start talking about discrete event simulation uh, for modeling pathways and queuing problems. So discrete event simulation, or uh, DES, uh, is a, a way of modeling uh, queuing problems. Now, if we think to uh, a lot of problems uh, in the real world, particularly in healthcare as well, um, we, think, we think of a lot of problems that are essentially queuing problems. We've got uh, um, uh, a real world system where queues are building up as people are waiting. And sometimes they, they may be uh, physical queues, it might be literally people waiting in a, in a queue, uh, or it might be a more abstract queue, people on a waiting list, for example, but it's still a queue. So there's lots and lots of different queuing problems um, that we see in, in uh, health and social care and in uh, policing too. Um, now in a discrete event simulation, uh, our entities are things that are flowing through our system and they flow through and queue for discrete sequential processes. Uh, so things that happen uh, to these uh, entities and each of these processes uh, use uh, resources. So you've got things flowing through your system, things are happening to those things and in order for things to happen to those things we need resources. Um, so uh, we can, for example, imagine our entities as being uh, patients coming in, flowing through a patient pathway and lots of different processes, things happening to them in that pathway. So in our, the ED uh, uh, model uh, example that we talked about in the first session, you know, patients are getting triaged, um, they're registering at the registration desk, they're getting triaged, they're getting treated, et cetera. These are all processes and those processes use resources. So when they register at the registration desk, we need a free space at the registration desk and a, and a receptionist. Uh, when they've been triaged, they need a cubicle and a nurse, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so that's the fundamental concept of um, discrete event simulation. And because of that, um, discrete event simulation is typically used to model um, uh, pathway type problems. So, as I say, what happens when patients arrive at the ED or um, you know, the processes as people arrive into a, into a GP surgery or lots and lots of different things uh, within uh, health and social care that can be modelled um, in that way. And because of this, uh, discrete event simulation is really useful for asking those what if questions that are so important in operational research that we, we talked about at length in the very first session that we said the real power of modeling uh, is being able to uh, create a virtual representation of our system and then play around with it in a sandbox kind of way and, uh, uh, in, and in a safe environment and then to, to try things out and see what might happen. Um, and the discrete event simulation is fantastic for uh, being able to do that for pathway uh, problems, uh, queuing problems. So we can say, well, you know, we've got we've got a delay somewhere in our system. Uh, what if we were to do these things? Do we think that'll improve the delay? Do we think that'll improve the speed at which people come through the system and it'll reduce the bottlenecks? Um, or we might have, as you had in the uh, in the very first example game that we played, um, you know, we, we've got to cut costs. Uh, we need to uh, do either this or this. What do we think is going to be the uh, um, have the least negative impact? Uh, for patients. Um, so it's really useful uh, for those kinds of problems. So here's an example. Uh, let's imagine we've got a patient arriving at the ED. Uh, they get booked in and they're booked in by the receptionist. So we've got patient arriving. So patients are our entities. It doesn't always have to be patients so, uh, or people. 
Um, very often it is, but it doesn't have to be. So you can also have discrete event simulations where your entities are things like um, phone calls if you're modeling a, a call system, or um, test results if you're modeling, say, blood tests, for example. So they can be more abstract than, than people, but very often they are people. Uh, so here we've got our entities as patients. Um, we've got the first process here, patient is booked in, and in order to undertake that process, um, the, we need a receptionist, uh, they're then triaged, uh, and in order to undertake that process, we need a triage nurse. And then, as very often happens in discrete event simulations, different things might happen. So it may be as a result of the triage that no further actions are needed, or nothing that we want to model. Um, or it might be that they then need to be seen by the doctor, uh, and so the patient needs to be treated, and we'll need a cubicle and a doctor. Uh, and as a result of that, um, different things may happen again. So it may be that they're treated successfully and they're discharged, or it may be that they unfortunately die, um, or it may be that they are admitted to hospital um, for further, further observations. And in which case, if they then go down that path, they'll have a series of other processes and they'll need hospital beds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So th this is the kind of basic way in which you would start to think about how you would structure up a, um, a discrete event simulation. Uh, and remember, it's, it's, uh, it's entities, um, uh, in our case, patients here, flowing through uh, discrete sequential processes. Something happens to them, and then something else happens to them, and then something else happens to them. And at each stage, um, the, the things that happen to them uh, uh, very often require some sort of resource, um, and that resource is required to, uh, to undertake that, that process. That's basically the fundamental concept of discrete event simulation. So when we're building a uh, discrete event simulation, it's important to be aware of uh, the nomenclature um, for how we describe um, components of uh, uh, discrete event simulation, the building blocks uh, for putting these things together. Um, and there are a number of these um, such building blocks, um, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about them now. So uh, I've already talked a little bit about entities. So your entities are the things that are flowing through the sequential processes in the model. And as I say, it may it very often will be people, uh, so patients, or um, if you're a PSMA, it might be uh, you know detainees or officers, um, uh, telephone calls, blood test results, anything that is flowing through processes can be an entity. Now we need some way in which entities can uh, come into being can arrive into the model. Uh, and the way in which that happens in a discrete event simulation is uh, via a generator. So a generator basically, as the name would imply, creates entities. It, it, it spews them into the system. Um, now, it may well be that you just have one generator that, that pumps your uh, entities into the model. Um, but very often, you may have multiple generators to, to represent different ways in which people can come into the system, particularly um, if those different ways are important. So for example, you might have in an ED system, you may have uh, generators for uh, uh, patients coming in by uh, being brought in by paramedics. You might have a different generator uh, for people self-presenting at the ED because the rates at which they come in may be, may be different. Uh, and there may be other things that are different about the, the processes that they would follow, at least initially, uh, for, uh, for those patients. So you can have multiple uh, generators, but you do need at least one. Um, otherwise, you'll have a very uh, dull uh, discrete event simulation that doesn't actually do anything. Um, so as well as generators, th those are the things that are going to bring our entities into being. Um, there's also the concept of inter-arrival times. This is a fundamentally important concept in modeling. And an inter-arrival time, again, as the name uh, might suggest, simply specifies the time between entities uh, being generated or arriving into our model. Um, now, uh, you may have, for example, uh, patients arriving at the ED and um, uh, those who are self-presenting are arriving about every 10 minutes. So that would be our, our mean inter-arrival time. But of course, as we talked about in the very first session, uh, we would often want to build variability around that. So we typically sample from a distribution in order to, um, uh, in order to replicate our inter-arrival time. So we'd have a, an average, um, but then we would uh, sample uh, from a distribution with that average in order to uh, actually uh, work out the time that the next patient will arrive and then the next patient and so on. But these are fundamentally important 
uh, concepts. So you've got generators that are bringing your entities into being and into arrival times, which essentially uh, govern the time between uh, the new entities uh, being generated. So then once we get into the meat of the model, uh, we then have uh, the processes and uh, those are represented by uh, activities or servers. Um, these represent the those processes that we talked about. So the things we looked at back here, patient being booked in, patient being triaged, patient being treated, patient being admitted to the hospital, etc. Those are uh, activities or servers. Um, and uh, those are the things that the, uh, are um, going to be doing things to the entities. So triaging them or, or, or treating them or whatever it may be. And with any uh, activity or server, um, there will be uh, an amount of time that it will take in order for that process uh, to complete. And that's known as the activity or server time. Um, and again, you've already seen an example of this back in the very first session uh, where we said that, you know, patients are coming in every 10 minutes, taking two minutes to be triaged, uh, sorry, two minutes to be registered, five minutes to be triaged, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, we talked about there the importance of uh, building variability into those process types. So, um, uh, and we would do the same thing when you're building a discrete event simulation in, in reality. Um, we would have perhaps an average uh, for how long those things would take, but we would then sample from a distribution with that average to then work out exactly how long it's going to take for this particular patient to be triaged or this particular patient uh, to be treated, etc. Um, and the granularity with which you represent your activities, your real world activities, may differ depending on the kind of model you're building. So again, in the first session, we talked about um, uh, the level of detail within a model. Uh, are you going to go sort of very high level detail of this happens to the patient, then, then this happens, then this happens, or are you going to be going uh, much higher level and saying, you know, patient arrives, treated, bang out the door. It's, it's, uh, see, and, and there's no right or wrong answer. It depends what you're trying to do. And again, it tries, it depends on the question that you're trying to answer. You're, you're trying to build the simplest model that will um, adequately answer your your question your questions um, so uh, that's a decision that you would make for for each model that's part of the design process in designing your conceptual model um, that you're going to have a bit of practice on uh, today so each of these um, activities as I said will require uh, usually some resources uh, for those activities to take place, which may be uh, people resources, so things like nurses and doctors and receptionists, or there may be uh, physical uh, object uh, resources, things like beds or cubicles or reception desk. Um, uh, but either way, you need some sort of resource um, in order for that activity uh, to happen. And of course, that's where the magic happens in the discrete event simulation, because um, there's no point modelling that uh, um, you've got um, uh, essentially uh, a completely infinite resource unless you're doing an infinite capacity model which we talked a little bit about in the first session for slightly different reasons um, but typically you're you're going to want to limit that resource in some way you're going to say well actually we've we've only got a uh, three doctors on between these times but then after that uh, between these times we've only got two doctors and that doctor may be called away etc etc and we can model those things and see what impact it has because those processes then can't take place until those resources are available. Uh, so it allows us to model that kind, of, that kind of detail. So clearly in most systems, uh, you're not going to have the situation where everything just flows through nicely and nobody ever waits for anything because the real world doesn't work like that. They're gonna be waiting for resource to become available. Um, and so we need somewhere for our entities in the system uh, to wait uh, whilst uh, they are waiting for an activity. Um, and those things are uh, known as queues uh, within discrete event simulation. So um, these are essentially just where the entities are held um, until the activity has the uh, capacity and required resources uh, to begin. So, um, you know, if you need a triage nurse and a, and a free cubicle in order to do the triage, the, the patient will wait in the queue for that activity uh, until uh, those things are uh, available. And of course, the beauty of discrete event simulation is then we can uh, look at the uh, those cues, how they build up over time uh, and how that impacts the system uh, to get some sense about what the delays are in our in our system. 
And then lastly, we've, we've talked about how to get entities into the model and then what happens to entities within the model, uh, uh, within the processes of the model. Um, but of course we need some way for them uh, usually uh, to leave as well. And, uh, the way in which entities exit the model uh, are via things known as sinks. Uh, so sinks are essentially your exits from the model. And uh, like um, uh, generators, you may have more than one. In fact, you very often will. Uh, so there may be different ways in which people can leave. And we talked about an example of that a minute ago. It may be that somebody leaves because they're discharged from the hospital, and it may be, or it may be that they, they unfortunately pass away. Um, and it may be that it doesn't matter for the purposes of the model and what you're modeling uh, in terms of the distinction between those two. Um, but very often it will, um, and you probably want to model them slightly differently, uh, not least because, uh, you know, hopefully uh, more people will um, leave the model alive than, than dead uh, in most cases. Um, and so you'd have different rates. And also you may want to keep track of um, the number of people who have died versus the number of people uh, who've been discharged versus the number of people, uh, people who've been admitted, etc. And it's important to think about sinks not as the exit point from the larger system entirely. A sink in a discrete event simulation is just exit from the model that I'm interested in. It's the remember a model when we talked about scope in the very first session. We're just trying to capture that bit of the real world, that bit of the real world system that we're interested in. So it may be that we're just modeling uh, the emergency department and we don't care what happens after they leave it. And so we may have just lots of sinks indicating, you know, either they've been admitted or uh, to the main hospital, they've been discharged, but we don't care for the purposes of this model. Um, we just, we're just recording that they've gone off and exited our bit that we're, we're modeling. Um, so don't think of uh, sinks as being a sort of final exit from the, from the real world system. Uh, they're just ways in which they're leaving your model. They're leaving the point of interest uh, that you are trying to capture. So in our example, uh, we talked about uh, a minute ago, um, we can think of our, our generator generating new patients arriving at the ED, uh, and then we've got queues for each of these um, activities, uh, so patient being booked in, patient triage, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and uh, resources for each of those activities, so receptionist for here, triage nurse here, cubicle here, hospital bed here, etc. And we'll have inter-arrival time. So in our system here, we're just modeling one way into the ED. Uh, so we'd have inter-arrival times as being the um, uh, rate of arrivals into the emergency department. Um, uh, our entities are patients and uh, the activity times would be the time being spent booked in, the time being spent triaged, the time being spent uh, uh, being treated uh, and the time spent uh, in uh, hospital ward. Those would be the activity times that we'd need to uh, represent in our model. And then we'd have various sinks um, at different ways out of our model here. So we could have a sink where um, a patient has, has died over here after being treated. But similarly, we may have a sink over here where they've been triaged and no further actions required. And so we're no longer interested in that patient for our, for our model. So those are two very different ways. You know, if I was the patient, that's a very important distinction. But for the model, it's just two different ways out of uh, the model. So um, in order to try and get you to sort of understand the, the, the potential of um, discrete event simulation, um, particularly because historically um, discrete event simulation has been a big deal in operational research. And uh, I think it's fair to say uh, most of the stuff we've done in Pencord over the last 10 years historically uh, has been looking at discrete event simulation type, type problems, looking at pathway problems using discrete event simulation uh, for that. Um, so uh, a few of us are just going to talk to you um, this morning about some of the uh, historic um, discrete event simulation models that have been built within the team. Uh, just to give you some examples of some of the things that you can do with this uh, uh, with this stuff. Um, some of them older examples, some of them uh, very very recent um, uh, and current topical uh, examples too. Uh, so I'm going to kick things off uh, just by talking to you very briefly about um, a project I did with uh, Royal Cornwall Hospital um, a few years back uh, now, which was looking at um, reducing uh, referral to treatment times for um, uh, patients with muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer. Now, bladder cancer is the seventh most uh, common cancer in the UK, about 10,000 new cases uh, each year, uh, and about a fifth to a quarter of them 
uh, invade the muscle wall uh, of the bladder, so-called uh, muscle-invasive bladder cancer. Now, muscle-invasive bladder cancer is particularly nasty, um, and that's the, um, the kind of bladder cancer where you really need to be looking to get people treated uh, very quickly. Um, the five-year survival rate is only around 50%, um, and the definitive treatment for uh, muscle-invasive bladder cancer is uh, cystectomy uh, plus uh, chemotherapy. Um, and so we were approached by um, uh, Royal Cornwall Hospitals um, uh, by one of the uh, urologists uh, there who was particularly interested in um, using modelling to try and work out where the delays were in uh, their pathway. They knew there were uh, delays in the pathway, they knew they had a problem, but they, and they had some idea about where those delays might be. Incidentally, they were wrong, um, which shows the value of modelling. Um, but they, they thought they knew where the delays were, but they, they also acknowledged they, they didn't know for sure. Um, but they wanted to find out where those delays were and can we do things about that to try and improve things? Because, you know, muscle invasive bladder cancer and nasty, uh, nasty disease and, and uh, um, delays clearly lead to far, far poorer outcomes. So by using modeling to try and um, uh, look at that system as a whole uh, and to explore where the delays are building up, and then see importantly where um, improvements can be made can be really, really uh, useful. Uh, so we uh, did some uh, modeling. We took uh, two years uh, of data, 2015 to, to 16, um, and we used that to help parameterize a uh, discrete event simulation model. Um, we found that their time from uh, referral to uh, referral for definitive treatment uh, was about 89 days um, at the time. And I say referral to referral for definitive treatment because um, uh, so Royal Cornwall Hospital don't actually offer the, uh, the, the definitive treatment um, uh, there. Uh, their patients would then be referred to, uh, to Derriford uh, for that treatment. So we were looking at the time in which they first came in uh, up to the time at which they would be uh, referred to Derriford uh, for, their, for their definitive treatment. Um, so first thing we did was to build a model of what was uh, then uh, the current pathway. Now um, this is a screenshot from a piece of software uh, called Simulate which we used to use um, and which I mentioned uh, before in the team. It's a nice piece of software. Um, it's uh, £3,000 per license. Um, so it's very expensive um, and uh, it also has the disadvantage that uh, unfortunately uh, because it's a uh, paid for piece of software you can't easily share models and kind of goes against our ethos we want to be able to share things openly uh, with people so um uh, uh, but in, in case you're wondering this is this is what uh, this is the system we use at the time um but you can see the core components here that i've just been talking about the idea of um generators bringing in in this case new referrals into the system uh and then activities these are the little plus signs here the little first aid kit signs um and then these little tanks here represent the, the queues for those activities um, and then different branching paths uh, and then a sink at the end uh, as they leave. So basically patients were coming in, uh, they get a cystoscopy, uh, they then get referred for a uh, TRBT which is a transurethral resection of the bladder tumour uh, and then two parallel things happen at the same time. They get a discussion of the case at their multidisciplinary team uh, and they get contacted by a nurse specialist or a local urologist um, to uh, discuss their, their diagnosis. Once both of those things had happened, uh, they would then be uh, simultaneously referred to Derriford and also uh, referred to uh, an oncologist. Uh, and once both of those things would be done, that they would essentially exit our bid of the system. So clearly they haven't left, they haven't been treated, but we're not modeling the, the treatment, we're modeling the point at which uh, they have been referred for definitive treatments. A nice example of what I literally was just talking about. So the key thing we wanted to use this for was first of all to find out well where are the delays and you can probably already see just from this little snapshot uh, where some of those delays uh, may be building. Uh, so we found uh, actually it's a, a poor example because it <laughs> didn't, didn't capture it where the uh, where the real problem was but uh, when we ran this uh, in earnest we found that the first uh, bottleneck uh, was the wait for the transurethral uh, uh, resection of the bladder tumour after the cystoscopy. Uh, that had an average of 43 days uh, from uh, cystoscopy to the uh, TURBT. Um, 
which represented about a third of the time that the patient was in this bit of the system. So from the referral to being referred to Dara for their definitive treatment, about a third of the time was just waiting for this TURBT. So it's a big chunk of time. The second big bottleneck was waiting for the nurse specialist or urologist to discuss the diagnosis and treatment options uh, with the patient. And on average, that was taking about 25 days, about 20% of the time, so about a fifth of the time they're in the system, was actually just waiting for a nurse to uh, contact the patient and talk to them and say, unfortunately, this is your diagnosis. We need to discuss uh, treatment options. What, what, you know, how do you want to uh, proceed? So that's a pretty big wait for something as, uh, as vital as that. So clearly, those are two big things that were, uh, that were jumping out. So what we did, we took this model along and we showed, uh, we got uh, um, uh, consultant neurologists, um, other people involved in the pathway, nurses, etc. Um, sat down in a room, in fact we sat in a cafe, uh, it was very nice, had a nice brownie. Um, and uh, we, we sat down and I showed them the model and I said, this is where your, um, your, your delays are building up. What can you do about that? Can you think of some things that would change that? And it generated a fantastic discussion as they all started uh, talking about maybe we could do this, maybe we could do that. Uh, because they were motivated by knowing finally where the where the delays were actually happening uh, and they came up with um, some suggestions and as they came up with those suggestions I was then able to uh, test those changes live in the model and say well okay well the model predicts if you were to do that we think you'd uh, this this would be the impact um, and so uh, they came up with a number of ideas um, and two of the key ideas that they settled on were what if those pa we're, we're pretty good as uh, consultant neurologists uh, at uh, picking up uh, suspected muscle invasive cases. And they thought we were pretty good at that. So why don't we, where we think it is muscle invasive, um, before, uh, you know, before they've had the TRBT, before that, if we think someone's muscle invasive, we'll fast track them. Uh, so in other words, um, uh, they would get their TRBT uh, within two weeks, which if you look back, uh, to what was happening before, that was uh, an average of 43 days. So that's quite a difference. So what if we were to fast track those patients? And what if, rather than waiting around separately for uh, what was happening at the time, was the nurse very often would call the patient at home a few weeks later to discuss their diagnosis. What if when the patient comes in for their TURBT, the nurse actually spoke to the patient whilst on the board uh, about the diagnosis and discussed treatment options? So those are two potential solutions to try and reduce those two key bottlenecks that we identified. So we plugged those changes into the model and the model predicted that if they were to do that, just making those two pretty simple changes, the time from referral to referral for definitive treatment at Dereford were reduced by five and a half weeks. Now that's massive. That's a huge amount of time, particularly if you're a muscle invasive bladder cancer patient for which time is critical in order to, to um, ensure that you're getting a better, a better chance of uh, better outcomes. So huge. Difference. And it was so huge uh, in terms of the predicted uh, time saving that uh, the uh, consultant, um, lead, um, head consultant uh, immediately uh, went away and rewrote the protocol for muscle invasive bladder cancer patients within 24 hours uh, they had a new protocol and uh, two days later the the process was being used and that's an immensely quick turnaround um, for making a uh, quite a radical change to, to their process. So then in May 2017 they sent us um, three months of uh, data um, that they collected post implementation to see if um, the, these, uh, these changes had the desired effect and what we found was that the uh, mean time to the uh, transurethral resection of the bladder tumour had reduced uh, by three and a half weeks uh, for fast track patients and also nine days across all patients. And of course, the, you know, the danger with fast tracking patients is that potentially some other patients then have to wait longer. Um, and actually, I think what was happening was that because they were so engaged, and this is a very common thing, that because they're all becoming engaged and aware of the system, uh, and their processes in a more system-like way, remember we talked about that in the very first session, that suddenly uh, they, they were making changes subconsciously and, uh, and, and speeding things up and doing things differently. And it was leading to a positive change for everyone, not just for those patients uh, who were being fast-tracked. And then we also found that the, uh, the average time 
uh, to being contacted by a nurse specialist have reduced by uh, five weeks for fast track patients. Uh, and again, 11 days for all patients. Um, and so this had a massive impact in terms of the referral to referral to definitive treatment um, time for muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer patients uh, in, in Cornwall. Um, the dotted line here sort of just shows the uh, 62 uh, day target, um, which instantly doesn't come from the, uh, the treatment it's, it's, it's a point earlier. So they were actually meeting um, that target score, although it doesn't look that way. Um, but uh, even so, they were, they were pretty close to it. Uh, and actually this brought them right back under that, really speeding through um, patients. Um, so the blue bars represent um, pre-change, so the, the ones on the left, this is the uh, referral uh, from referral to the TRBT. And on the right, we've got referral uh, to being contacted by a nurse specialist. Um, and as you can see, that was nearly 80 days before. Uh, so, uh, and after, um, the changes have been made for fast track patients for 40 days um, so or just over 40 days and if you think about that if you're a patient with muscle invasive bladder cancer you're going to find out 40 days sooner that you've got a diagnosis uh, 40 days sooner that you can make those decisions important decisions about your your treatment how you want to proceed and 40 days shaved off this horrible horrible condition uh, and so that's a massive difference for patients. So, and really through some pretty simple modeling. So really simple modeling, getting people engaged, identifying where the bottlenecks are, getting them to think about what might change in the system, and then putting uh, that into the model, getting some predictions, and then getting those real, real world uh, changes affected. Massive impact. And my uh, absolute um, uh, message from that would be, sim just think simple, but powerful models can really make uh, a huge difference. Okay, so uh, enough of me talking for a moment. Um, Alison is now going to talk to you uh, a little bit about um, uh, some work she did uh, for her PhD, which she's probably fed up with uh, by now because she's just, been writing, just finished writing her thesis, which uh, is a painful process uh, in itself. Um, Alison, do you want, uh, shall I um, allow you to share screen? Have you got it off on yours? Uh, yeah, this is fine. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, just stop share. Uh, oh, that's going to stop the recording, isn't it? Uh, um, hello. So, uh, have you got the PDF? Got the PDF? Yeah, that? let me bring that up instead, I think. So does that mean you'll have to slide it around a bit? Can you hear me okay? Do I need to... you're, you're, you're a little bit faint, uh, Alison, for me. I don't know if um, that's the same for anybody else. How about if I'm here? The, yeah, you're, you're sort of dipping in and out a bit, so um, a talk far louder than you think you should, I think. Would be bad. Uh, um, <laughs> oh no, that's far worse. Does that work? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. okay. I'll go back for a while. Yeah, see if we can go on. I'll, I, I may have to interrupt you if you're, uh, if you're um, sort of breaking off or anything like that. Yeah, sorry. I, my laptop might be fine. I might have other people. Okay, can you? Yeah, am I around a minute? Uh, pretty faint. <laughs> Whoa. Um, if, if this doesn't work, I mean, maybe uh, as an alternative, perhaps if you could um, record a little video and post it up to YouTube, I wonder if that might be uh, a way around it, because I, I think we're going to struggle to hear you. Let me just try again, getting right up to my lap. Who are we here? That sounded a bit better. Say something else. <laughs> um, I'm right here now. <laughs> Is that going all right? It, it's it's certainly better. You still break up a little bit, but it is better. So give it give it a whirl. Let's see what's yeah. Going. Okay. Um, I can't from here. Um, I can't actually see my screen. So, um, shall I just give you a nod when I think you need to change slide down? Is that okay? Yeah, that's that's cool. Fine. Okay. So, um, as Dan said, the this um is a model that I built. It's a sort of proof of concept model. So I'm going to talk through more about how it, how the yeah uh, the model looks, the simulation looks, rather than uh, my kind of dramatic outputs and in the world. But um, this is part of my PhD work and I built the simulation model um, which is intended to be triggered by short and crowding forecast. So say um, in two hours the CD is be crowded and then the simulation can be run for the next two hours so it's, it's, um, for very, uh, very short decision support. Sorry Alison you're, you're, you're really breaking up. Oh uh, okay this isn't going to work is it? I'm really sorry. Really sorry for that. Yeah. 
if you could, if you can perhaps um, record the, the presentation of the video, so Mike's done the same. Um, yeah. That's if you can record that and then we'll make that available. Um, I'm just thinking we'll, we'll, there's lots of good stuff that, that for you to talk about there. I don't, don't want that to get lost. <laughs> in yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Sorry about that, everyone. Okay. We'll, 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 we'll try again. Uh, so in which case I'm going to move on to our next one. So Tom, I think Tom is there. Is Tom, Tom there? I am here. Fantastic, I can hear you, that's a good start. That's a good start, yes. <laughs> uh, you should be able to see me as well, I've turned on my camera. Oh yeah, I've got you. <laughs> good, so how did you want me to do this, Dan? Because I'm gonna, because of course my slides are also separate. Uh, oh yes, that's a very good point. Uh, is the, have you put the link in Slack? Uh, I have it ready to go now, um, one second. Yeah. If Dan, if you allow Tom to share his screen, yeah, he shouldn't, it shouldn't stop the recording or anything. No, oh, okay. Oh, he won't interrupt that. Okay, that's good. Uh, yeah. So, if I, should I try sharing my screen? Yeah, I'm just, uh, how do I switch over to allow, because usually I get that option at the bottom. Um, so, it about, says, yeah, it says you've disabled screen sharing. Let me see if I can do it in here. That's really annoying, isn't it? I can't seem to enable screen sharing without, oh, hang on, I can stop sharing. That will keep the recording going, I believe. Yes, I'm still recording. This, we look great here. Uh, this, <laughs> sorry, I apologize. <laughs> we probably should have practiced this. Uh, <laughs> all participants. Right, now you should be able to do that. This, that, 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 was, that was really smooth and polished. <laughs> There we go. Hooray. It's still recording. Good. <laughs> okay. Can I just check? You can see uh, the screen and well, let me, let me launch this because I've had problems before where when it launches, people can't see it. Looks like so we can. You can. And, and you can see me flicking between slides. Yep. Yep. That was good. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> uh, hello everyone. Uh, okay. So um, short presentation about some work. Um, a uh, study Mike and I were involved in at the, st at the start of the pandemic. Um, so we were contacted by um, uh, the Wessex Kidney Centre um, to help them think through some plans that they had that they were very rapidly putting in place um, around keeping dialysis patients safe um, throughout, the, throughout the pandemic. Um, so this was, um, we had to do this work very quickly um, at the start, it was it was pretty much all simulation based, um, and uh, it was used directly to, to sort of inform their planning and really stress test if their if their plans went far enough. Um, so we we wrote this up at the same time. Uh, we tried to get it out. So if you want to have a look at uh, this in more detail, there's a there's a bitly link here. COVID sim dialysis and we made all of the data and all of the code available for this study um, so that's in something called GitLab which is a bit similar to GitHub if you've come across that and um, so that's bit.ly slash dialysis hyphen code so you can have a look at all the simulation code that we used um, in this study um, and then there's a very hand wavy paper uh, about how simulation modeling can help reduce the impact of COVID-19 in, in general, which is published in the Journal of Simulation. Um, that's very sort of um, fluffy, talking about how amazing simulation is type paper. Um, so you notice this one's got 471 views and this one's got 10,000 views. Actually, it's something like 20,000 views now, and this is like 500, um, which is quite interesting because one of these studies is far more useful than the other. Um, so yeah, so what what happened? Um, just minimise this. Uh, so right at the start, um, just before lockdown, um, so the NHS substantially stepped up their planning. Um, so uh, the the kind of the view at that time uh, was that a, a reasonable worst case scenario was that eighty percent of the population would become infected over three to six months which, I mean, that's not, that's not happened. Um, so the UK was beginning to social distance, um, but for dialysis patients, uh, that, that isn't possible because um, they still need to travel into, an inter into outpatient clinics and interact with the NHS on a regular basis. 
Um, so this project was really about separation. How do you keep um, infected patients separate from uninfected patients and, and still manage all of that within the capacity that you have? Um, so this was with the Essex Kin Kidney Centre. So this is the working in Hampshire. Um, just to zoom in on a map, um, the, st the stars represent their treatment facility. So it's from network of, of dialysis facilities. Um, and the, uh, the, um, the red circles are where, where demand is coming from. In this case, we had postcode sector data. And the, si the size of that circle represents the, the density of patients in that area, the number of patients that are coming from that particular area. Um, so you can see that's clustered around the bigger cities of, of Portsmouth South and Southampton. Um, so in total, they had about 650 patients. Um, so it's a fairly static population. Um, you'd expect some change over longer time periods. Um, but one of the complexities we didn't really twig to at, this, at the start of this project was that about two thirds of those patients require transport into an outpatient clinic. Um, so there needs to be some way to keep patients safe during transport as well. So like I say, this project was about separating infected and uninfected patients. So um, the plans that were being put in place very rapidly um, were a special COVID-19 ambulance. Um, and that the plan originally was to transport one infected patient at a time. So, one, so this is one confirmed positive patient at a time. Centralise outpatient dialysis for infected patients to the largest site, which is at Portsmouth. Um, so there's a question then of, is there sufficient capacity to do that over time in, the, in a worst case scenario? Um, separate people by time. Uh, so you could have um, people working in uh, so shifts so that you would have an, a, a shift for or infected patients and a shift for uninfected. And there'd obviously have to be some sort of clean down in between. Uh, and literally build a wall in the... Um, in the ward. So this actually happened very rapidly while we were working on this project. A giant perspex wall was built down the centre of the wall, ward um, and the NHS sort of remarked this was the, the quickest decision making they'd ever seen in their, in their careers within the NHS. So what were we aiming to do? So um, with Covid, uh, no matter what anyone says, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. So all we can do is look at a range of scenarios and try and get an understanding of are our plans robust enough to deal with um, the most likely range of those. Um, and, so, and so that's what we were doing here. We were, we were looking at what the NHS were putting into place and then looking at, at the time, what we thought were a reasonable set of scenarios um, how, and how robust would the system be in those situations. Um, so we were interested in if so we're going to look at uh, the worst case scenario here and we're going to look at what happens to outpatients and inpa inpatient workload over time and we're going to we're going to do that through simulation so we're going to look at each of those facilities and see what happens to the workload over time in each of them um, are the patient transport plans feasible um, a bit of a spoiler is no then no they're not and I hope you perhaps could have sensed that from the, um, from the idea of having a sing single ambulance to do this job. Um, and what impact is there on transport by allowing more than one infected patient in an ambulance at a time? So these are, this is non-emergency transport, it's patient transport services run by um, the South Central Ambulance Service in, in that region. Um, and what we wanted to do was develop tools that could be used by any dialysis service in theory, um, because it was quite clear at that point that there would be further waves of this and COVID would go on for a long time. So we wanted some planning tools that other people could use. So we, we wrote everything in Python and made it publicly available. But the big problem was we needed to do all this very quickly. So speeding up a bit. So very quickly, um, we needed to build a discrete event simulation model of the network. Um, we needed to think about transport and the feasibility of transport so we use Monte Carlo simulation there so it's similar to what um, discrete event simulation is 
um, but we needed some way of constructing routes to pick people up. Um, so we used um, some heuristics there, which are uh, tools that will give you a reasonably good solution, a good planning solution. Um, and we use scenarios to handle uncertainty about the spread of COVID-19. Um, so the discrete event simulation at a high level looked like this. So exactly like Dan's ED model that he showed you shortly before, that, that there was a series of stages that entities flowed through in the model. So everyone started out negative. Um, and over time, they, trans they transferred into a positive state. Um, some of those patients would become then inpatients. They would be admitted to the hospital. Um, and some of those patients would recover over time. And then unfortunately, some, obviously some of those patients would die. And we have some information about death rates from COVID in the dialysis population, some early data that we, that we used in the model. So this is the sort of output that you would get out of a, a simulation model. Um, and you're probably quite familiar with looking at sort of um, curves like this from um, all of the studies that have been shown in the, in the UK media. Um, so we can, you can see we've got a, a time horizon. We've, we've, we've modeled over 140 days here on the, on the x-axis, on the y-axis. We've got um, the number of patients and then the different colored lines represent patients within different states within the model. Um, so for example, we can see in blue the number of negative patients dropping over time and then leveling off. Um, and in black, we can see uh, the total number of positive patients over time. And that these lines are a bit more wiggly than you might see in uh, some of the studies that have been sort of very public. And that's because we used um, discrete event simulation. So it was a stochastic model with variability built into it. Um, so yeah, so we had, a, we had a set of these for each of the, um, the facilities that provided dialysis. Um, so we can we can see these here and we could plot all of those at the same time um, and then run different scenarios through the model. So here we're looking at the, the reasonable worst case scenario um, and what would happen if we centralised care. Um, so we can see here this is uh, HU is um, the main hub, which is, which is at Portsmouth. Um, and we can see this is where the most positive cases are. Everywhere else, you see a dip in the number of patients there, and that's because their patients are gradually becoming infected and are moving towards this centralised hub. Um, however, there is at Basingstoke, you can see there's a, there's a short spike in positive outpatients here, and that's because um, in a worst case scenario, the centralised hub didn't have sufficient capacity to care for all of those patients. So that was news to the, to the Wessex Kidney Centre. They, they, they hadn't, uh, they thought their plans um, went far enough when in actual fact, in a worst case scenario, they didn't. Now, remember, this is not a prediction. This is a scenario, which, which is a bit different. We're not forecasting the future here. So, uh, last bit is about patient transport. Um, so, this was about getting a, a feel for if, it was feasible to have a single ambulance to pick up patients and bring them in. So we used the information from the simulation model to inform what was the likely number of patients that might be infected at any time. Um, and again, we had a, a number of scenarios. So we had some days where there were 15 patients that needed to be picked up. But in a worst case scenario, there might be up to 60 patients that need to be, that need to be picked up. Um, so if you think of this from, in a, from a sort of modeling point of view, we have a geographic problem. Um, we, have a, we have a home base. We have a, you know, a place where the ambulance travels from and to, which will be the hospital. And we have a number of patients that need to be picked up. And so what we used were heuristics to build routes to pick those patients up. And the routes were trying to minimize travel time. And um, so we used some GIS software, some geographic information software to, to get some travel times and then we put that into um, some heuristics to build um, routes. And because we didn't know which patients were going to be infected, we used simulation. Um, so we, we simulated uh, which patients were infected on different days to get, a, to get an idea of the distributions of travel times that might be seen. So you get information like this out of such a model. You 
So you can look at scenarios. So we've got three scenarios here of 20 to 60 positive patients. Um, and then on the x-axis, we have the number of, the, well, basically the capacity of the ambulance. How many positive patients are we going to transport? And you can see that in all of those scenarios, the driving time to pick up a, a single patient and return to home base is, is totally infeasible. Um, and you've still actually got problems when you get down to, to four patients. So, we, so even if, so what we felt, our advice was this probably wasn't a good thing to do with a single ambulance. Um, so one of the things they decided to do was um, effectively hoteling positive patients. So they would use the hotels which were empty near to the hospital um, and move, move patients who are positive into those for a short period of time so that they could come in for their treatment. So, in summary, um, there was a problem really if this worst case scenario of, of the spread of COVID came true. Um, they, they wouldn't be able to keep all patients at a single site. Um, there was also, I didn't go into it, but there was also an issue with inpatient capacity um, at the centralised site that was likely to be breached in, in a worst case scenario. Um, and then uh, we gave them some evidence around the planning of transporting COVID patients that really that wasn't a feasible approach. Um, and they need to think they need to think about that. Yes, there were savings from allowing more patients into the positive patients into the ambulance at any time. But there was there, there was very little benefit from taking that approach in general. It was not wasn't feasible. Um, so what actually happened? How did this project work in practice? So we spoke to them first on the 18th of March. Um, it's all a bit of a fog now, but I'm pretty sure that was pre-lockdown. Um, so we we uh, we got anonymised data very quickly. It came within the hour. That's the first time that's ever happened in a project. Um, so we, we, we agreed to deliver preliminary results within a week. Um, so it was a very busy week, the first week. Um, but the, the bit about the transport was something we didn't really twig to start, to start off with. Um, so that, that those were two separate intertwined modeling project projects. Um, and we only really realized about the second one towards the end of the second week. So that we then had a very busy weekend. Um, we had to do this in a very collaborative way so we had to work directly with the nhs um, so sometimes that was just mike for example um, who was having um, a zoom call with the nhs while i was sat at home you know feeling quite old and scratching my head and um, because uh, i've forgotten how to do some of these things and um, so it took us two weeks to to do all that work um, that was it was quite a lot of work um, and it's all there for you to take a look at and learn from importantly. And that was, that was one of my big objectives from this um, because we didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, but ideally we would have some material that other people could then either learn from or, or use in the future. So that's available for you um, to check out, please do. Um, and feel free to ask me any questions. Thanks Dan. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. That was fantastic. Um, so before we move on, uh, does anybody have any uh, questions either for Tom or for myself for any of uh, the projects or anything we, we, we've talked about? Uh, hello. 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 I, I just wanted to ask about um, the, the Cornwall um, Black um cancer yeah. and did you um follow up to see if there was an in, impact on health outcomes for those individuals that were fast tracked uh so no we, we we haven't done that piece of work but i i, I believe um uh, cornwall were going to be looking at that i don't know what happened with that is the honest All right, thing. Okay. but um but yeah you would you would certainly hope that that would be the case given the um the scale of the the time saving the other potential issue though we had with that is that um You've still got a delay at uh, potentially at Derriford because, of course, they're they're not in control of the treatment. They're only in control of the referral to Derriford for treatment. Um, uh, so, if there are any delays in uh, the system at Derriford, um, then potentially that that could have had a knock-on impact as well. Um, uh, and we did try to um, explore that, but I think they were changing a lot of their processes at, at, at the time, so we didn't manage to get a, 
project off the ground but in reality that's exactly what you would want to look at look at that side of the system too to see if you can reduce the delays post referral to therapies as well hi can i can i ask something yeah sure um you the urology example seemed like a very nice clean process that um it was easily separable from everything else and how common is it that you find um find that whereas tom's example seemed much more um intertwined with um other factors and uh, that that i'd imagine would make it more difficult to model yes i i you're absolutely you're absolutely right and I, I i have to say i think the uh for a number of reasons i think the bladder cancer work was uh, quite atypical of uh you know the, we, we managed to get uh, good solid data we had fantastic engagement all the way through uh we had you know immediate impact the, 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 you know the the idea of getting somebody changing a system within uh, 24 hours of delivering the results is unheard of so uh, this was a, this was uh, quite typical in that sense so you're right in the you know in reality you would have a lot of uh, compl uh, complexities interlinking uh, bits of the system um, that you have to deal with as a modeler and sometimes that means um, uh, using uh, Tom and Mike's approach which is where you say right okay well that's that's a really important thing that we're going to need to model. So we need to effectively have two models, um, uh, uh, two modeling problems here that we need to deal with. Um, in other cases, sometimes you think, okay, that that's that system over here that's sort of linking in may have some impact, um, and we need to capture it in some way. But can I simplify that down so it may be that you're just uh, representing a you know a, a new arrival rate into your model that you need to be aware of uh, uh, for example and that you need to capture but you don't need to model the intricacies and all of that comes down to uh, what you're going to be practicing for the rest of the morning actually which is um, uh, how you design your model how you uh, build that conceptual model the decisions you make in terms of what you're going to capture what needs to be captured um, you know the scope the level of detail all of those things that we uh, we talked to you about um, right at the very start um, uh, that's that's uh, all of the things you need to consider really as a as a modeler so you're you're absolutely right i think the um uh, the bladder cancer uh, uh project was a beautiful project in a nut for a number of reasons but um uh you're right it was very much more standalone than some other projects that we've we've done where things get very quickly messy i think is fair to say hello can i ask a question about uh the travel times that were used in uh, in the second model that Tom yeah, sure. explained. Um, you said about that you use some geographical GIS software to get the travel times for the different locations. I wondered if you could explain a bit more about how that worked and what the what the process was for that. Um, so, um, so, so Mike uses a piece of software called Rutino, which is open source. Um, so Rutino can generate um, travel time information about routes. Now that is, um, so there's some shortcomings with that data. Um, so the data is uh, deterministic for a start. So um, it will give you different types of speeds on different roads and things like that. Um, but it will give you sort of, it takes this amount of time to get from A to B rather than, a, rather than distribution. Um, and the second thing is, um, the travel times or the travel speeds that it uses aren't always realistic. So um, Mike might be able to chip in here, but we sometimes calibrate that information against a different source so that we get a um, sort of adjusted travel times for some of these routes. And uh, it escapes me this morning if we did that. On we did, quite on, yeah, we did. We calibrated against <coughs> Google. Oh dear. Um, yeah. So uh, Google's Google's the best the best source personally. So all travel time modeling and that I think sort of pales in comparison to what you can get out of Google. The issue with Google is it's 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 not free. Um, so we we tend to use a free and open source approach, calibrated. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. So so for the Google, you said that Google's not free. I I thought they have an API that you can use. Is that not free to access? Um, for a certain amount of data, yes. Right, right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, for a certain amount of data, but you, um, it's. I think. Uh, well, Mike may may have a view. I mean, I, I kind of think our approach is good and it's it's easier. 
Um, what, what's your view, Mike? Oh, sorry, I wasn't, I was muted. Uh, so my view is uh, all GIS information is wrong um, because, you know, on any particular day, any particular circumstances, you, you can't uh, predictly precise, uh, predict, precisely predict even um, the travel time something's going to take. The question is, is it reasonably accurate enough for modelling? You know, and you go back to think, well, what am I trying to do here? Is it absolutely essential that I get this to within the right minute? Or am I trying to work out roughly where, where do I think is the best place to go normally? Um, so I think using, so Google gets astronomically expensive with large geographic problems. And some of our geographic problems require millions of routes, route times. Um, it, it's a feasible solution for a small number, but you still then, you know, what are you going to predict? You're going to predict time, travel time during the day, during the night, rush hour, non-rush hour. Is an ambulance, not an ambulance? Is an ambulance with blue flashing lights? Um, so I think, like a lot of modelling, you're simplifying the real world and you have to ask, is this a reasonable simplification for the problem I am trying to solve? And, and in, in simulation, which you're going to be doing a bit of later, um, you can think of you can think of travel times in terms of a distribution. Um, so in some of the, the simpler models that that I've done around ambulance travel, um, we we've looked at you know the range of times it might might take to get from point A to B and plug that into the model and sample from it. Now that's still a simplification, and um, but it, it does it does help a little bit with some of the um, some of the problems Mike was describing, but it won't help you with models that require millions and millions of routes. It will, it will quickly become an infeasible approach computationally if you, if you do that. I'm going to have to move us on, I'm afraid, but thank you very much uh, for those questions. If you do have any uh, um, further questions, uh, uh, please you know, um, contact us on Slack. I'm sure uh, Tom, Mike and I will be very happy to uh, chat further um, about any of these things. Um, uh, we'll also get um, uh, Alison's uh, presentation up uh, for you. Mike's also recorded a, uh, a video which we'll, we'll link to um, uh, uh, about some work that he's been doing. So um, uh, there's lots of uh, examples and it'd be worth have you having a look at these examples? I think it gives you a really good sense of um, some of the things you can do with this stuff. And a lot of it is, you know, getting those creative juices flowing and, and, uh, and thinking about how you can approach things. So um, I've talked long enough. Um, and what I'm going to do is suggest that we have a comfort break. But before I do that, I'm going to set you uh, your main exercise so that you can uh, go and stretch your legs um, and then uh, plow straight on uh, with um, this uh, exercise here. So this is a group exercise um, that you're going to be doing um, this morning. Uh, so I want you to work in your uh, peer support groups um, and uh, do remember that we've put your um, links to your uh, Zoom calls and Teams calls in your channel description under your channel titles uh, so you can easily access them there. So, uh, so ignore the groups of three to four bit. What I want you to do is um, uh, to read uh, this information here which I'll just briefly go over. Um, so we've got a local GP surgery which has two receptionists, uh, three GPs and a nurse. Uh, the surgery is open Monday to Friday from 8.30 till 6. Uh, patients who want to see a GP must first call into the surgery uh, where a receptionist uh, will ask what the problem is um, and then pass their details to a GP to call them back. Now when I say uh, the patients uh, have to call into the surgery, uh, it pointed out to me the other day, thank you Kerry, uh, I mean telephone call. Uh, so um, that, that could be uh, um, misconstrued. So it, they have to telephone the surgery first uh, and the receptionist will, will, will uh, uh, take their details. Uh, within a few hours usually GP will call the patient uh, back and they will triage the patient over the phone initially. Um, now the GP may decide that no further action is needed uh, or they might prescribe some medication for the patient uh, which will be ready to collect from the reception within an hour. But in some cases the GP may decide the patient needs to be uh, seen in person uh, so they can perform uh, an examination, physical examination. Um, and these patients are asked to come into the surgery and they're then seen on a first come, first serve basis by the GP who asked them to come in. Uh, now the GP may provide the patient with a prescription as a result of that, uh, which will be handed directly uh, to the patient by the GP at the end of the consultation. Um, it may be that some tests are required and if so, uh, the GP will ask the patient to 
uh, speak to the receptionist on their way out to book in an appointment uh, with the nurse to perform the test. As well as answering calls from patients looking to make appointments, uh, the receptionist will also deal with calls uh, inquiring about prescriptions and test results. They'll provide prescription slips to the patients. They'll book appointments for patients with the nurse and they'll carry out other administrative duties. Uh, the nurse, in addition to performing tests for patients, uh, also runs a, a daily two-hour weight loss clinic, which provides advice to anyone who wants to, uh, to speak to them. Uh, people waiting, uh, wanting to attend the weight loss clinic simply arrive at the surgery during the, the, the clinic slot, and they, get, uh, they wait to uh, be seen by, by the nurse. Now, the GP partners have approached you as they're very pleased with how the, uh, the weight loss clinic is going, uh, and they'd like to set up a nurse-led uh, quit smoking consultations within that same clinic. Uh, so uh, rather than a new clinic, they're going to set up uh, essentially a combined weight loss and quit smoking uh, consultation clinic where people can come along within that slot, uh, in that two-hour slot, and they can talk to the nurse either about weight loss or, 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 or um, quitting smoking. Uh, but they're unsure whether the nurse they've got currently has the capacity to lead these consultations or whether they need to bring in a second nurse who would run a dedicated and separate quit smoking clinic. So separate from the weight loss clinic, we'll have another nurse that runs a quit smoking clinic completely separately um, to try and avoid lengthy waits to see the uh, nurse who's also, of course, doing uh, tests as well as the weight loss stuff. Um, so uh, they've asked you to build a model uh, to help them better uh, understand this. Now, the good news is you're not going to build the uh, discrete event simulation model here in case you're, you're worried, but this is a good example of the kind of problem that you may well get uh, in the real world. Um, so what you're going to do in your groups, the first thing I want you to do is to draw a process map of the system we've described. Uh, and please be aware there's more than one process being described here. Uh, so think about that when you're, you're uh, developing a process map. I want you to write uh, some what if or what if questions uh, that capture what has been asked of you as the modeler. So maybe there's more than one question. And then I want you to draw up a design for a discrete event simulation model based on the what if questions you've uh, identified. I want you to indicate the generators, the queues, the activities, the resources, the sinks that you would include in the model. And I want you to list uh, the entities that would be in the model, the inter-arrival times that you would need, the activity times that you'd need for this model. Now, the, my key advice with this is to think about this as a very much a three-stage process. In the first stage of the process mapping, you're very much thinking you need to capture everything you've, you've been told. You need to get everything uh, down uh, and describe uh, all of these systems. Then think about what you're really being asked in terms of um, uh, uh, the, the, the modeling questions. What, 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 what uh, are the questions the model is setting out to answer? And then when you come to think about your model, think about what we've talked about in the very first session about scope and level of detail. Not everything that in your process map you're necessarily going to want to translate over into your design for a model. So think about the real world system you've captured in the process map and the what if questions you've identified and, and think about how you would design a model uh, that would capture uh, those, uh, uh, answer that question as simply as possible. So you're looking to, 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 to uh, build a model that uh, contains a, as much simplification as possible but that which can still adequately answer the question and capture enough of the system uh, to be able uh, to do that. Uh, so I'm going to give you a little bit, we've, we've overrun quite a bit, so um, I'm going to give you a slightly different time. So I, I suggest you all sort of stretch your legs for, for at least five minutes or so, uh, take a bit of a break. Uh, we're then going to resume at um, uh, 10 to 12, so 11.50. Um, so uh, you've got uh, um, about an hour after you stretch your legs um, to do this, work in your groups, uh, we as mentors will be uh, dipping in and out of the discussions. I'm really excited to hear um, what you're going to uh, be discussing. Um, there's no single right answer to this. I'm really interested to see what you, what you come up with. I've got a potential solution that I will put forward, but it's not necessarily the only solution. So this is really to get you practicing, thinking about how you would translate a real world complex system into a discrete event simulation. Any questions about any of that before we before we go into the exercise? No? 
great okay uh take a break take a short break uh, and then assemble in your groups uh, i say we'll resume at 11 50 uh, and uh, I'll, I'll be really curious to hear uh, some of the designs uh, that you come up with. So remember, process map the system, then extract the what if question or questions uh, that you think have been asked of you, and then design your model using um, uh, indicating all of these components that we've talked about, uh, entities, generators, queues, all of that indicate uh, uh, what, how you think this model will look. Okay, I will see you in an hour. Have fun. <laughs>